Welcome to Public Domain Video Theater presented by the great detectives of old time radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Now it's time for another episode of Dragnet. This episode was based on a radio episode that aired October the 27th of 1953. On TV, it aired September 2nd, 1954. It was Season 4, Episode 2, and the title is The Big Fraud. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. Los Angeles, California. I work here. I'm a cop. It was Tuesday, August 10th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko Fugitive Detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. My name's Friday. I'd spent the morning in court testifying in a fraud case. It was 11.45 a.m. and I had to get back to work. I'm telling you, you better do something about it. Getting terrible when a citizen has a thing like this happen to it. All right, Mr. Mather, take it easy. Tell us what it's I got a lot of friends in this town. I have no one of the counts. I'm a real good. And if you don't clean this thing up, you're going to be walking the beat out in the plum thicket. Now, wait a minute. Here's my partner. Tell us what you it's all about. You don't need no partners. You get out yeah. there and arrest them fellas. You get them. What's the matter here? Mr. Mather, my partner, Sergeant Friday. How do you do, sir? Won't you come around here trying to smooth things over? I'm not going to be happy. Them hoodlums are in jail where they belong. I'm telling you, same as I told this fella, you do something about this, or I'm going to take it to the mayor. Well, what's the matter? I don't know. I'm trying to find out. Well, what you going to do about it? Would you like a cigarette, sir? You bet. Thank you. Here, I got a light. What you going to do about it? Sir? Well, how about it? What you going to do? Well, if you start right at the beginning and tell us what this is all about, maybe we can give you a hand here. Well, if ain't a shoe shine in the world that's worth five dollars, I don't care what kind of wax they use. Not for five dollars, no, sir. Shoe shine? Yeah. They call it imported wax. The way they charge for it must be brought in from Timbuktu. Ridiculous. I got the report, Joe. They take that match and they light it and they burn the edges of your shoe soles. Don't do nothing but smoke up your shoes, that's all. Just smoke up your shoes, a five-dollar hot foot. What's your full name, sir? Keith Jefferson Mather. Right there on the street to threaten me. Well, now, if you'll just tell us in your own words what happened. Well, sir, I was on my way to work. Had a very busy day, a lot of important appointments. I just parked my car and I was walking along. I went by this place. A fellow standing there asked me if I wanted to shine. Just so happened I did, so I climbed in the chair. Climbed up, read the paper. Say, this isn't catching them, fellas. Let's have a little action here. Set all them questions. We have to get the information, Mr. Mather. We'll pick up the men. Would you like to go on with your story, please? Well, I was sitting there reading the paper, and the man asked me if I wanted imported wax. I wasn't paying a lot of attention. I guess I said yes. Next thing I know, I think he's trying to give me a hot foot. Look down, you know, and he got this here big kitchen match out. Like this here. And he's smoke coming up, you know, and he's burning the edges of my soles. I told him to stop it. I got down from the chair. I was plenty sore. You can just bet I was. Plenty. Yes, sir. We can understand. Well, I hand him a half a dollar. Figured that'd take care of the tip, too. Wasn't a very good shine. Come right down to it, a half a dollar was too much. All that smoke. Next thing I know, he said the shine was five dollars. Five dollars almost climbed right down top of the place. I couldn't believe my ears. Can you imagine five dollars for a shine? Are you sure that they didn't have a card showing the prices of the shines? Well, I don't think they did. At least ways I didn't notice it. Does that make a difference? Well, yes, sir, it would. Now, I told you that this has happened before. The city council passed an ordinance that all shoe shine parlors have to have a sign showing their prices. Now, if this place doesn't have the sign, we can file on them. If they list the price of an imported wax shine as being $5, and there's nothing we can do about it. We'll finish up this report, and then if you'll point out the place, we'll have a look. Well, then you can just start writing. I got a lot of important appointments. I can't spend all day in here. I'm tired. Excuse me, please. Yes, sir. Frank, you want to go ahead with this? Sure. All right, sir. Just a minute. Yes, sir. Can I help you? I want to give myself up. Sir, this is Bunko Fugitive, isn't it? That's what it says on the door. Yes, sir. That's right. And I want to give myself up. I'm tired of running. I haven't got any place to go. Do you want to tell me what this is all about? I gave him every nickel I had. I haven't even got enough money to go home. All I want is enough to eat on and get back home. I gave him everything. Yes, sir. I don't think I understand. I gave him all the money I had. He said it'd be all right. 
Now I'm broke and I want to borrow enough to get home. But what are you talking about? Who'd you give the money to? The policeman. The man who'd walked into our office identified himself as Martin Dietrich. He told us he was broke and that he was hungry. We turned the shoeshine parlor complaint over to other officers for investigation, and then we took Dietrich across the street to a cafe. I'm from Chicago. I work for a wholesale drug company back there. I had to come out here on business. Got in last Saturday. That'd be August 7th. Yeah, the 7th. Got in at 8.45 on the super chief. I didn't have any business to do until yesterday, so I thought I'd let the town over. We'd get settled. Huh? Yes, sir. I didn't even have hotel reservations. So after I got off the train, I was waiting for my baggage to be checked through, and I went over to a little coffee stand. Sat down, started to read the paper. Must have been there for 15 to 20 minutes when this guy came in, sat down next to me. Go ahead. We just sat there for a few minutes. I didn't pay any attention to him. Busy reading the paper, you know. Mm-hmm. Thanks. You want to go ahead? Well, then he asked me for a match. I gave him one, told him to keep the pack. I remember telling him that. The next thing I know, we're in a big conversation. Turns out he's from Chicago, too. I see. Did he tell you his name? He said it was Gabriel Bush. Told me he was in the wholesale liquor business. Said he was out here on a selling trip, checking up on the branch office. I went right along with him. Seemed like such a nice fella. Well-dressed, cultured. Even knowing it, you sure wouldn't figure him for what he was. What was that, sir? A narcotic addict. Were you sure about that? I should be. Cost me over $3,000 to find out. You want to go on, sir? Well, like I told you, we got to talking about Chicago. Tried to see if we knew any of the same people back there. Turned out we didn't. Then we went over to get our baggage. Picked that up and we walked outside. Mm-hmm. We were standing there waiting for a cab and this bush fella asked me where I was staying. He said maybe we could get together for dinner. See, this is my first trip out here. Bush said he'd made it several times before and he knew the place pretty good. Told me he'd show me the town. When I told him I didn't have any place to stay. He asked me to go to his hotel with him. Said something about a convention in town and rooms were pretty hard to get, but I could stay with him until I found a place. Well, he unpacked his bag... I guess I should have noticed something then, the way he acted. How do you mean? When he took the stuff out of his bag, he acted like he didn't want me to see what he was doing. But he did it in a funny way, so I couldn't miss noticing it. You know what I mean? I think I do. Well, he went into the bathroom, stayed in there for a couple of minutes, and then when he came out, he had his sleeve rolled up. He had a piece of cotton on his arm, like when you give a transfusion. You know, here? Yeah. He had this little leather case. When he went to put it away, he dropped it. Spilled the stuff in it all over the floor. I should have gotten out right then. Right there, if I'd have had any brains, I'd have gotten out. What was in the case? Could you see? All the stuff for taking narcotics. Hypodermic needle, all the stuff. Well, what did he say when he dropped it? He just tried to laugh it off. Then he told me he was a diabetic, said he had to take insulin shots. About that time, the other two guys came in. They knocked on the door, and Gabe went to let them in. They had guns and told us to get our hands up, said they were policemen. Did they have any kind of identification? Yeah, badges. Showed them to us. Then they started to question Gabe. What did these two men want? Said Gabe was a narcotic addict. Said they'd been after him for a long time, that they'd gotten word from the Chicago police that he was coming out here. Mm-hmm. Told me they'd been following us since we got off the train. Been following us all the time. What'd they do there? Took us downstairs and put us in a car. Said they were going to take us to jail. I tried to talk to them, tell them I didn't have any part in what Gabe was doing. I didn't even know about the narcotics. And one of them said they knew that. That you weren't involved in it, huh? Yeah, then the other one opened up the glove compartment of the car and took out a microphone. Called into police headquarters. Gave him Gabe's name and mine. Said they had us in custody and were bringing us in. I kept asking the one guy in the back with me to let me go. Let me out of the car. Yeah. The one fellow said that if I could afford to take care of all the policemen who knew that I'd been picked up, maybe they could fix it. The other one, the one in the front seat, said it wasn't a good idea that they should book me. They got in a discussion about it. The one guy wanted to let me go. The other one said not to. Finally, the one with me in the back seat won out. I gave him all the money I had. $3,350. Now, the badge these two men showed you, did it look like this one? I think so. I was so worried I didn't look real close at it. I think it was the same. Either one of them tell you their names? Not the one in the front seat. The one who wanted to let me go said his name was Lang. Said he was a sergeant. He tell you where he worked? Just narcotics, that's all he said. You gave him all this money in cash, did you? Yeah, all of it. You know him? You know these two officers? No, sir, we don't. He said they were policemen. The badges, the police car, even the radio. Will you show us the hotel where this happened? Sure, but I don't understand all this. The other two policemen said that if I gave them the money, everything would be all right. They said they could fix it up. Now, I don't want any trouble. All I want is enough money to get home. They said they'd fix the whole thing up. They told me there wouldn't be any trouble. No trouble. Yes, sir. You think they're real cops? I wouldn't know, but they're wrong about one thing. What's that? There's going to be trouble. 
12.52 p.m. We took the victim, Martin Dietrich, back to the city hall. We got in touch with Lieutenant Ionone, Internal Affairs Division. We filled him in on what had happened. He started an immediate check of all police officers in the city and the county. Working from the description we'd gotten from the victim, we notified the narcotics detail and they went to work on it. A local and an APB were gotten out on the suspects. We checked the name Gabriel Bush through R&I. But when the mug shots from the packages we came up with were shown to Dietrich, he was unable to give us an identification. 3.15 p.m., we drove the victim out to the hotel where he told us the shakedown had occurred. We talked to the cashier at the hotel. She told us that the bill for the room had been paid by Gabriel Bush at 2.15 the afternoon of the shakedown, three hours after Martin Dietrich had turned over the money to the thieves. She told us that the bill had been paid with cash and that she could give us no further information on the man. We obtained the registration card the suspect had signed when he checked into the hotel. In the usual processing of the card by hotel employees, it had been handled so much that lifting fingerprints from it was impossible. The card was turned over to Don Meyer in handwriting to be checked. 5.20 p.m., the victim started to look through the photographs of police officers. Lieutenant Ionone's preliminary investigation had failed to turn up any police officers who matched the description of the shakedown men. At 1.26 a.m., the victim finished looking at the last picture without finding the men who'd claimed that they were police officers. A check with the officers from the narcotics division netted us nothing. They were still checking their sources of information to help us in coming up with a lead. We checked out of the office and Dietrich spent the night at Frank's house. The following morning, Wednesday, August 11th, 8.04 a.m., Frank and I met with Chief of Detective Stad Brown. Well, where are you on it? Not too far. What have you got? Well, we checked the files. We're pretty sure that they aren't policemen. How about narcotics? They come up with anything yet? Not yet. They're still working on it. You add it up and you haven't got anything. Right, right? Pretty close, Chief. You know how I feel on this kind of thing. I want it stopped. Every time these guys take a mark, they're putting every policeman in the world in a bad spot. Right off, we got a victim who swears a crooked officer should come down. Yes, sir. Need any extra men? Not right now. Might later. Johnny DeVetta's standing by. Use anybody else you need, but clean this thing up. Yeah. Got any idea how they made the mark? Well, the story we got doesn't help much. Dietrich was having a cup of coffee, and they approached him. I don't know how these car men work it. They can spot a man with a bank roll five miles off. By the time he walks up, they've got a new Dodge worked out and ready to go to work. Well, if we knew how to stop that, we'd be out of jobs, wouldn't we? I'd rather have it that way. Where do you go from here? Well, we're getting descriptions out to all the hotels, warning them about the racket, asking them to call us if this Bush fellow registers again. Doesn't seem he'll use the same name again. No reason not to. He doesn't know we're onto him. I suppose so. I got an idea last night. Might work. At least to be something to start on. All right, let's hear it. Figures that the only men who'll go for this dodge have got responsible positions in their hometowns. If they didn't, they wouldn't care about being brought down here along with Bush, right? That follows. They gotta be from out of town so the con men can get rid of them fast. Yeah. Now, this Dietrich. He was picked up in a coffee shop near the station, right? Yeah. Then if you're gonna pick your man up, that's the place to do it. Try to nail him while they're setting the mark. Yeah, it might work. Be better if one of us was the mark. That's what I had in mind. You got any good luggage, Joe? Expensive looking? Oh, I got a set that somebody gave me last Christmas. Looks good. We'll try it then. Smith, your work would be better. Keep a tail on Friday from the time he gets off the train. Here, Joe. Yeah. Here's a timetable. What? Tomorrow morning you start riding the train. Thursday, August 12th. I drove out to Pasadena. At 8.12 a.m., I caught the train on its last stop before the Union Depot in Los Angeles. At 8.45 a.m., the train pulled into the station. I picked up my luggage and left the terminal. From there, I walked over to the coffee stand the victim Martin Dietrich had told us about. From where I sat, I could see Frank and Sergeant John DeBetta farther down the counter. I waited an hour. During that time, no attempt had been made to approach me. I looked for anyone matching the description of the suspect Bush, but if he was there, I didn't see him. At 10.15 a.m., we called off the operation for the day. On Sunday, August 15th, I went through the same procedure. After the waitress brought my coffee, I waited. 9.32 a.m. Pardon me, you mind if I sit down here? No, go right ahead. Here, I'll get my hat out of the way. I'll get it for you. Thank you. Sure tell you're not a Californian. Hardly anybody out here wears a hat. That's so? Yeah. Where are you from? Chicago. Take the chief in? Yeah, I just thought I'd have a cup of coffee here before I start out to find a hotel. Guess I ought to introduce myself. I'm Gabriel Bush. My friends call me Gabe. My name's Joe Friday. Did you just get in, too? Yeah, I work for a wholesale liquor company in Chicago. Well, 
It's a small world, isn't it? Where are your offices? State Street. We got a little trouble with our West Coast office, so the boss sent me out to see if I can straighten it out. What are you doing here? All kind of business and pleasure. What line you in? Machine tools. Uh-huh. How long are you going to be in town? Well, as a matter of fact, I'm leaving Tuesday. It doesn't give you a lot of time here. You know anybody in town? No, sir, not a soul. Where'd you say you were staying? I'm not staying any place yet. I haven't got a place. Thought I'd go over to the Statler. Oh, you're not going to get in there. Matter of fact, you're going to have a rough time getting in any place. There's a big convention in town. There just aren't any rooms to be had. I made my reservation a couple of weeks ago. The office out here took care of it. Well, I didn't know it'd be that crowded. Say, tell you what. Yeah. Come on over to my hotel. You can park your luggage there, and I'll get in touch with a couple of friends here and see what they can do. Well, that's pretty nice of you, but I don't want you to go to any trouble. I'll find a place, all right. It's no trouble at all. Can't let a fellow Chicagoan stand out in the cold. I'm sure the boys can find you a place. As a matter of fact, I'll talk to the clerk where I'm staying. Might even be able to fix you up there. I do a lot of business there. They'll do what they can. Sure, nice of you. You sure it's no trouble? Not at all. Come on now. Oh, is this all your luggage, just the one bag? Yeah, that's all. Well, let's shove off. We'll get your room and we're all set. Aren't you going to order anything? No, I'll grab something at the hotel. Say, you got anything planned for tonight? No, nothing special. Good. I know a great place uptown. Good food and great music. Sounds all right. Yeah, it is. No, I sure appreciate this. Don't think anything about it. Who knows? Maybe you'll be able to do something for me sometime. Yeah, maybe I can. We walked out of the coffee stand and took a cab to a hotel out on Wilshire Boulevard. Frank and Johnny DeBetta followed us. After we'd registered, we went upstairs. All the time, he kept up a running conversation about how difficult it was to get a hotel room. The bellboy left our bags in the room and asked if we wanted them opened. Bush made it apparent to both the boy and to me that he was the only one who was going to open his suitcase. Bush unlocked his bag on the bed and snapped it open. He took out a small leather case, trying to keep me from seeing it and at the same time making sure that I did. He went into the bathroom. After a few minutes, he came out. He'd taken off his coat and his left shirt sleeve was rolled back. He had a small piece of cotton on his arm. feel a lot better now. What's the matter, something wrong? Oh, no, nothing at all. You see, I'm a diabetic. I have to take insulin shots. Oh, I see. I'll put this stuff back in the suitcase and we can start looking for room for you. Good. Oh, here, I'll give you a hand with that. Don't worry about it. I can get it. You forgot your spoon. Oh, yeah. I didn't know you used a spoon for insulin. I'll get it. Wait a minute. Let me put this stuff away. I just want to see what it is. Police officer, you're under arrest. What for? We haven't done anything. Narcotics. What do you mean, breaking in here like this? You've got no right to do that. All right, knock it off, Bush. We've been after you for a long time. We finally nailed you, now don't fall about it. This other fellow a cop, too? Yeah, this is my partner, Roger Silby. Well, listen, I had no part in this. I just met the guy. If you want him, okay, but don't tie me in with him. Too bad, mister. Get your coat. Where are we going? Downtown. we got to book you. But I had no part in this. I tell you, I just met this guy just this morning down at the depot. I just met him. I'm not mixed up in this. you got to believe me. My company finds out, it'll cost me my job. Now, you guys got to give me a break. You should have thought about that before, mister. A little late now. Don't you understand? If my boss hears about this, he'll can me. Oh, come on. Why don't you give the guy a break? He's telling the truth. I just met him. He's got no piece of the action. That's rough. Maybe next time he'll be more careful who he bums around with. Now, let's go. Please, give him a break. You guys are all alike. You cry when you get tagged. This isn't right. Let's go. We're taking you in. What's the charge? We'll tell you in jail. The two men had shown us badges when they came in. They'd flashed them by so fast that there was no way of taking a good look at them. They told us to get our things together. The plan was that I'd go with the suspects and give them the marked money when they asked for it. After that, they'd be taken into custody. Once the currency was in their possession, we could prove extortion, a felony. On the way out of the hotel lobby, I'd indicated to Frank and Debetta, who were staked out across the street, that we had the right men. We walked down to an alley. All right, boy, let's go. mistake here. We'll let the judge worry about that. I'll call in and tell him we're coming in. Right. This car 12-7, 12-7. We have two prisoners in custody. We're taking them downtown for booking. Repeat, we have two prisoners in custody. We're taking them downtown for booking. Over and out. All right, mister, get in. We got a long ride. Look, I don't understand any of this. What happens to me? We just book you. After that, it's up to the court. Yeah, but they'll turn me loose, won't they? I don't know. We got a big drive on now about narcotics. Courts are getting pretty rough. Had a guy up just last week. I caught him in a car with another fellow who was smoking marijuana. This one guy didn't even know it was tea, and they really nailed him. 
Hey, how long did they give Jansen? You mean on that tea wrap last week? Yeah. Five years. You see? They're really getting rough. Yeah, but I didn't have anything to do with this. Tell the court. But we know you're clean. We got word about Bush here coming out from Chicago. The department back there called us. They figured he was out here to make a buy. We've been after him for a long time. You just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Rough, but that's the way it is. Now, come on, get in the car. Sure, a lousy deal. This is going to ruin me. You know that. I'll lose my job. I'll be finished. I don't know. We'd like to help you out, but you can see there isn't any way. There must be. Sylvie? Yeah? How about it? Can't we just let him go? You tell me how we're going to get away with it. How are we going to explain when he isn't there to be booked? Look, he's a nice guy. I don't want to see him get into trouble for something he didn't do. Neither do I, but how do you figure to square it? Suppose we could take care of the watch commander. Maybe he'd forget we called in. Taking care of him is expensive. How much money you got on you? Oh, about $2,500. Not much. Can you raise any more? Oh, not without sending home. I can't do that. How about it, Sylvie? $2,500 enough? Don't go very far. A lot of people to take care of. That's all he's got. Well, it ain't enough. Let's book him. We've been riding together a long time, Sylvie. This is the lousiest deal we've ever had to pull. We take the 2500 explain to the commander it'll work. Let's give the guy a chance. If anything goes wrong, it's your neck. Yeah, I'll take the rap. Okay. we got to take Bush in, though. All right. Give me the money. Sure. There you are. That's all I got. Okay. All right, mister, get going. And if I were you, I'd get fast. I'm going to do that. Would you mind dropping me off downtown? This isn't a taxi service, mister. You're coming out of this smelling like a rose. Don't press your luck. Yeah, well, if you just drop me off near first and spring, that's all. What's there? City Hall. You're under arrest. The three men were taken into custody and the marked money was booked as evidence. We got in touch with the victim, Martin Dietrich, and asked him to come down to the city hall to give us an identification. That's them. You'll sign the complaint? You bet I will. I want to see him get there. Look, what's all the beef about? A little con game, that's all, so he took the mark. Shut up, Lang. They still got to prove it. Yeah, well, that ain't going to be hard with all the help your friend Gabe handed out to him. Imagine being so dumb you pick a cop for a mark. You went along with it. Now you're dumb, Gabe. Face it. All right. Let's go. You too. Don't give me no orders, cop. You got me in custody. That's enough for you. I'll go when I'm ready. Come on, Lang. You know something, cop? I think I played a part better than you do. I'm going to tell you something, mister, and I want you to remember it. As a con man, you're a flop. You wouldn't know a mark if he came up and hit you in the mouth. Besides being bad at that, you're a liar, the worst kind of liar. You go around telling people you're a cop, you flash a tin badge and write off you're the law. I've been in this business a long time. I've seen a lot of five tens come across the desk. Punks like you take old women, cheap crumbs with a handkerchief switch in the smack game, but at least they don't try to hide behind a phony badge. We don't know how many people you pulled this cheap deal on, but we're going to find out. We'll get every name there is, and we'll make you on all of them. I live in this town. I work here, and I like it. There are 4,000 other men in this city who feel the same way. Men who are trying to prove that the law is here to protect people, not to cut them down. They spend every day of the year running up a good score and you come along and tilt it. Every one of those people you hit thinks he's been taken by a cop. A cop whose hand was reaching for money that wasn't his. Yeah, you keep wearing that grin, Lang. See if you can still make it when we turn the key on you. Now let's go. You want to take him outside, Frank? I'll be right with you. Yeah. that all you need me for? Yeah, thanks a lot, Martin. We'll be in touch with you. Right. Too bad about all this, isn't it? Yeah, it is. All those people that bunch took, they're always going to think those guys were real cops. Yeah. They're never going to know. Of course, you can't blame them. Not really. Look how they got to me. I guess there isn't any way to tell. The guy flashes a badge, you know. How are you going to tell? There's one way. How are you going to know he's a fake? When he asks you for money.
On December 17th, trial was held in Department 92, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspect was tried and convicted of violation of Section 518 PC, extortion, which is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one, nor more than ten years. Roger Silby was tried and convicted of the same charges and is now serving his term in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Gerald Lang was tried and convicted of the same charges and is now serving his term in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Welcome back. Well, this was an episode that had a few things in it that reminded me of the later 1960s uh, TV series. First of all, there was a similar story that was done during season two of the color series called the Badge Racket, which also involved crooks pretending to be police officers, But there were enough differences in it that it's pretty clear that it was a similar story and not the same story redone. This episode also features Harry Bartell wearing an eye patch, which would also be done in the season four episode of the Revive series uh, during the episode DHQ Night School. I think with both the eye patch and the hat worn by Jack Crucian in this episode, you have an effort to make it less obvious that they're bringing back the same actor multiple times. In fact, Crucian would play four different parts during season four, Bartell six. However, the thing that most calls to mind the 1960s would be the Joe Friday speech. Arguably, this is the first big speech that Friday gave. It's much shorter than the 1960s speeches, but generally pretty effective. It's perfectly justified given the crime committed, and Friday's feelings are totally understandable. So it's a really satisfying moment. Friday's answer to Dietrich at the end is uh, understandable. And it's definitely true that the vast majority of actual police officers aren't going to do that sort of shakedown. The episode creates an effective contrast between these fake police officers and Frank Smith, who let Dietrich stay at his house. However, part of the reason that scams like that work is that there have been, and unfortunately are, still corrupt police officers. I do think that these fake police officers had a lot of giveaways. Their radio procedure was very, very rough. Over and out is one of those really classic uh, amateurish lines that is generally not used because technically it tends to translate, you can talk, but I won't listen. That and nobody answered them on the radio. And they didn't give Dietrich time to see their badges. And they talked like they walked out of a 1930s movie. 
Of course, these finer points that would undermine their credibility are things that the marks will generally miss. Thus why they were able to get away with it, and at, as we watch the end, it doesn't look like they were able to find anybody else that uh, these guys had taken advantage of. Despite what Friday said in his speech. All right, well, that will do it for now. Join us back here next time for another episode of Public Domain Video Theater. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And if you like these videos, you can become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.